Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of Digital Age Expo. I'm, it's my pleasure to welcome John Chisholm to our presentation today. Um, John, is um, his description is inspiring leaders and teams across the UK and Europe. He spent the last 15 years developing leaders and teams for businesses of all shapes and sizes, and his Bath-based management training company have an enviable client list. Um, it's absolutely my pleasure to welcome John to present Teamwork Makes the Dream Work. So John, over to you and welcome. Hi, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen then, and we're just going to stick some slides up. And hopefully everyone can see that okay. Is that okay? Everyone yeah, here? brilliant. Rachel, that's really helpful. And thank you so much for the introduction. So thanks very much for joining me this morning. Uh, I'd like to take you through a short presentation about teamwork and making the dream work. So I've kind of made a bit of a guess, really, that dream might be your success in business, I suppose, I hope. So um, this presentation is about looking through the lens of management and leadership skills. Skills. So at Crescent Management Centre, we provide a, a lot of different management and leadership skills for people in small and medium sized businesses and large organisations and so on as well. And so I, I guess it's kind of you'd expect us to come come to a presentation and, and look at things through that, uh, you know, through through that sort of lens. Um, so I think this presentation is for business owners. Um, if you're not a business owner, then you might find it useful anyway. And I've done it sort of as a as a little sort of journey and a bit of a sort of self-reflective vibe going on as well. So there's some questions that you I will ask you uh, and you can consider for yourself as we go along. So let's have a think about the small business context then and just jump into motivation a little bit now I appreciate there's lots of different aspects to to, mo uh, to motivation to small business context but certainly if I think about my own career and I've worked in large organizations in senior management positions and uh, director positions and I've uh, managed and run and sold and failed at uh, I think five or six small businesses now so lots of experience of, of both. And the reason why people, maybe you, uh, and certainly me, we don't want to be employed is for the following reasons, really. So I thought we'd have a look at that. I think sometimes the things that get us down, and, and, and this is uh, borne out by science. So Harvard Business School has done this piece of work several times and various other organizations before them. Um, the things that get us down when we're an employee, so too much red tape or bureaucracy, uh, there's too many layers and too many kind of people and things and stuff in the way. Um, it's somebody else's dream. It's not your dream. And I think that can sort of tip over into a lack of autonomy sometimes. So we don't have control over where things go. Uh, and we don't have autonomy like day to day as well. But I was thinking kind of big picture for that one. Um, maybe you weren't very good at the job. Who knows? You know, like, and, and actually, we do advocate people not being too good at their job sometimes, but that's a whole nother presentation, a whole nother conversation. Um, but maybe we were just sort of okay at it and we weren't really getting much self satisfaction from it, for example. So we could think about that. Um, another aspect of being employed might be that it's just a bit boring. Like it lacks variety. There wasn't any sort of freedom, I guess, that relates to autonomy. So lack of variety. And um, probably your boss was incompetent. Um, and maybe their boss was incompetent too. And I know that's a very bold statement. But actually, in our world, our job, part of our job, really, our mission for our training business, as a specialist in management and leadership skills, is to try and rid the world of incompetent managers. And 70, just over 70% of managers in a recent survey by the Chartered Management Institute found that actually most managers are accidental. They didn't really want the job. Maybe they just got good at it or they, they were promoted, whatever. So incompetent management, steep hierarchies. So, you know, five people or 
in my experience, the worst was about 10 people who had to sign off on, you know, something fairly kind of minor. And it, it just gets in the way. And the politics that goes with that is annoying, too. And then another reason why we don't want to be employed anymore is that we find not only managers annoying, but we also might have find colleagues that are annoying, too. So why don't we just not do that anymore? And why don't we become a business owner? Such a good idea. So let's have a little look what that might look like. So thinking about almost like the alternative to all of those, then if you're a business owner, you've got the agility, you don't have the red tape and the bureaucracy, you can change things in an instant. Uh, it's not someone else's dream, it's your dream, you've got total autonomy. Maybe you get to use your preferred skill set. So instead of being an average, I don't know, housing officer or something, you get to be a brilliant woodworker or something like that. You know, actually, it's something oftentimes people turn a hobby into a business as well. And that's the sort of thing I was thinking there. Lots of variety in the role of business owner. And um, this is the one that I'm kind of interested in. Competent management, finally. Um, maybe. Uh, are you? <laughs> and that's what we're going to go on to. Um, and then annoying colleagues instead, because you get to choose your colleagues as a business owner. So maybe you get fun colleagues instead of annoying ones. Now, I have had to put some asterisks in here because the problem with being a business owner, that list looks really great. And it kind of reminds me why I am a business owner. But what about if your dream's not compatible with what people want to buy? You know, what if you're interested in making sort of weird stuff or stuff that's, you know, kind of not what people want at the moment? Um, what about if you're not actually competent to lead and manage your own business? So you've, uh, you've had a career maybe as an employee, swearing at your boss on occasions and getting fed up with the layers of hierarchy but actually now it's your job and you get to do everything are you actually any good at it and so yeah that's that's the big question um, and do you have any new colleagues so this is a presentation about teamwork and skills and, and management sort of view of that um, and are the colleagues that you've got actually fun how do you choose a fun colleague so there you go, that's the context. So my first little piece of reflection for you is thinking through this idea of your own management and leadership skills and reflecting on yourself for a minute and be brave, be honest. Um, what skills did you have when you were employed? What were you good at? What were your some of your kind of signature signature strengths? What did people know you for or like you for? Were you good at the spreadsheets and the managing or were you good at the relationship building or what have you? And then again, what is your honest appraisal right now of yourself in terms of the skills you need as a business owner? And are they the same? Are they different? I think they're probably quite different. OK, so let's have a look at management and leadership skills then. Um, I just jotted these lists down yesterday. Um, it's part of my job to write these lists out, I don't know, a million times now. So I just kind of grab at stuff. But I didn't want to make too many assumptions that everybody kind of knows the difference, as it were, between managing and leading. And equally, I want to try and keep it fairly simple um, and just run through, yeah, some, some kind of broad ideas, really. So I think management skills is about completing tasks, it's about clarifying work, it's about monitoring and measuring day-to-day -day performance, making sure you've got all the skills you need in your team and for yourself, improving systems and processes, um, but probably incremental improvements, I would say, solving a lot of operational day-to-day -day problems, things that go wrong, um, getting presenters onto Zoom and those sorts of things, you know, just kind of day-to-day -day management of stuff. And I think personally, that's about self-discipline. It's about self-management, self-control. And so being able to manage yourself, uh, that's the kind of self bit of management. So, uh, so I want you to just kind of briefly reflect on, on these lists in a moment. On the leadership side, I think leadership is much more, instead of it being task-related behaviours, it's about relationships. So 
again in your with your sort of business owner hat on are you good at building relationships and are you good at building trust in those relationships are we good at inspiring and motivating people uh, are you good at aligning people to your plan to your goals your strategy um are you good at increasing team welfare and maybe team inclusion as well if we want to bring it up to date a little bit you've come up with the innovative products and services because the other stuff isn't needed anymore or because of covid or whatever so you've got to kind of rethink things quickly and then go forward with that and you've got to make decisions therefore on direction and how you're going to achieve stuff and i think leadership's more about self-awareness from a knowing yourself point of view so not about self-discipline but more about self-awareness what you're good at and not so good at and what are your strengths what gets you down what drives you uh, and so on and quite often it's about sharing those things with with other people really so a, a couple more questions for you to reflect on three actually thinking about again your management and leadership skills how confident are you in those skills what's your degree of confidence in your management skills the, the task stuff the processes and the spreadsheets and the leadership skills the relationship stuff what are your signature strengths and skills and what are your development areas now i know you're probably thinking some of you might be thinking at this point this sounds like a sort of performance appraisal <laughs> you've come out of work you're not going to be in work anymore so all the things like appraisals that some of the stuff that you might have hated and being sent on training courses you didn't want to do and all that and then john here is uh <laughs> i'm bringing it back in a way so it does feel a little bit like that but again at least you choose to do it and how you do it and, and you know it's not driven by somebody else so the fun bit still in being a business owner, I think, is you're doing this because you want to, not because somebody else is dragging you through some horrible paperwork and going to kind of, you know, score you on it or something like that. So it's a self appraisal, I guess. Um, so I'm asking you to review your skills. Are you any good? And what are you good at, what are you not good at? Okay. So what does success look like? Dream work, uh, I said uh, the dream might be your success in your business. And that is defined by you. You know, again, it's another reason for, for being a business owner is you get to define it. Um, now, I think just again, by way of reflection, this is what people have been doing. Business owners have been doing through the recent pandemic over the last year or two now. Um, and I think it's what people do have done in the past. Uh, and I think it's what people will continue to do in the future. I think these are the kind of key, this is like the key stuff of, of business owners and, and, and you know, kind of senior managers and business directors and so on. You're gonna need a crystal ball or some other method of anticipating the future. So anticipatory skills, are you any good at that? Um, do you know what to listen out for? What are you tuned in for? Sorry, tuned in to. What do you read? What do you listen to? What do you watch? Where do you get your information from? Is it? Are you getting it sooner than other competitors? Are you even bothered about that? Um, but anticipatory kind of skills. The next thing I think we need in terms of being successful is about being able to identify and define problems um, so what problems have we got today and how are we going to solve that? And it could be a small problem, but it, I'm kind of thinking here it could be like a big problem. Um, so something like, uh, again, obviously most like most people, my, my examples are going to be related to the COVID um, pandemic. But, you know, if you were a, a hotel and suddenly almost overnight all of your bookings were cancelled, now what? Uh, could we have seen that coming? So can we anticipate, can we identify and then define the problems? So a key skill is problem solving. We'll come back to that. The next step in this process that I think people have been doing by way of, you know, sort of unpicking our, our recent experience as business owners is exploring possible solutions and considering what options are available. And I think then we need to go into assessing each one of those. 
Now, a lot of this stuff for me, as a former director of, a, of large organizations, I knew it was my job to do this and I got better at it over time. But I think sometimes as a business owner and certainly as a small business owner, you might have kind of missed that this is a skill set. There's a process here that you can follow and it doesn't have to be quite so daunting if you've got your own approach or method or a reliable way of, of, of doing this. So it can be a bit kind of scary, this, or, or a lot scary if it's your, your livelihood and, and, you know, kind of paying, paying the bills. The management skill then of assessing options, I'm thinking is around considering costs, risks, benefits, timings, actions you're going to take and so on. Um, and so we've got a problem. We've identified it and we've defined it. We're going to explore some possible options. We're going to research and assess each of those options. And then we're going to decide what to do. So making decisions and feel com feeling comfortable with that. And I certainly know in terms of our business and my own experience as managing director of our own business, that that can be you, you're committing yourself and your time and your money you know, so we're talking about costs and timings and so on up here. And I'm also committing that of my, you know, money that, that, that we have or, or that we need to find as a business, but also that of my staff and maybe even customers as well. So making these decisions and then sticking to them is actually, I think that's the, the, that's the tricky bit. You make the decision and then a day later, are you still doubting it? A week later, is it the right thing? You know, a month later and £10,000 has is gone into it. Is it still the right thing? Nine months, 12 months, you're doing kind of 60 hour days. It's certainly what my uh, my COVID experience has been like. Um, what, uh, what do we need? And I think it's courage. I think it's courage to take action. Um, and it's probably courage to take action now rather than when it's too late. And I don't mean necessarily always like too late. Oh, we must beat the competition to this or competition to that. Because I think there's a lot of cooperation in business as much as there is competition. You know, I think we need to start thinking in that in a more sort of circular way. Certainly, um, certainly we do. Obviously, I kind of want to beat the competition, but it's but we also need to sort of survive sometimes when when we're in a crisis so courage to take action so that might not be what what you think is required for success there may be other stuff but i think the leadership bit shows itself in number six there really which is the that's the leadership bit doing the right thing and and being able to commit you and and, and other people to that and money and so on to that So again, just a, a, another brief uh, reflection, if I, if I may. Again, considering your management and leadership skills, what gives you courage? Now, it kind of made me smile when I wrote that, because probably people are going to go with like a funny answer. You're going to say wine or something like that. And that's totally fine, as long as it doesn't become a health problem. You know, look after yourselves. But it's not an easy one to answer. And when we do leadership development programs, which we do you know, all the time, but certainly working with middle and people moving, stepping up into senior management roles, which is kind of similar to business owners, I think, you need to know, in, in my opinion, you need to know the answer to this. Like, how inspirational are you? How do you do inspiration? What is your motivation? How are you able to, to put that across to other people? Uh, and we'll come on we'll come on to them in a minute so this courage thing that that's quite deep personal reflection it might be faith it might be uh, a, you know like a partner or a business partner or a, an activity or I, I don't know what gives you courage but actually to think about it honestly and to be able to manage yourself and look after yourself and then drive your business to be successful then I think we need to know how this works for us it's very personal I'm sure what support do you need? This is a slightly easier way of accessing the answer to the question, I think. What support do you need? And I'm going to add to that because it's a key feature of all of our programs. What challenge do you need? When I say challenge, I mean sort of like critical friend. You know, it's great to get 
I don't know, you're going to get support from family members, usually anyway, you know, they're going to say, oh, well done, keep going, you know, you'll get that sort of moral support, hopefully. But what the, the idea as a business person of, of taking business advice from my mom or, you know, from a family member or whatever is, is probably not the best place to get that. So where are you getting the challenge from and what level and what's the nature of the challenge? And you needed to have answered the previous questions in my presentation, I think, to get a sense of the fact that you know that you need challenging. Otherwise, you're going to lose momentum or you're going to be you're going to go too fast or you're going to throw too much money or too little money at it or whatever it may be. Where's that critical friend? Where's that challenge coming from? for you to lead yourself and resources and maybe other people successfully. So my principle here for this presentation for you today, which is teamwork makes the dream work, is simple. And that is that I don't think that you and I can succeed in business alone. So who, who then, <laughs> who's the team? So I wanted to take a bit of a practical approach. There's a load of ideas and some self-reflection. Let's just really briefly have a think about a practical approach, some ideas that might you might find useful for creating a winning team. Now, I have my take on this personally is we have some directly employed people. And sadly, through the pandemic, some people have gone and then actually some different roles have emerged and some new people have joined. But I also have lots of other people, like I'm sure many of you will have, that I consider to be my team members. And they are people who don't work for me. They work for other businesses. A lot of them work for themselves. Uh, some of them are big, medium and then small. Uh, you name it, really. And I choose, and this is the idea, principal idea, idea I'm sharing with you today, is that I consider them as part of my winning team. And I think my mindset of them being part of my winning team is what I'd like to share with you and is part of our success as a business. So let's keep it practical for a minute. I've said it already loads of times, so I won't go into the first point too much, but like an honest appraisal of you and your skills would be really good. Keep it simple. Just kind of put it under those two headings, management stuff, leadership stuff, or task related and relationship related uh, skills or behaviors. I think next within the given options, quite often you need to work out who, who, who you need to help you deliver your goals. And I think you should be specific. I think you should name individual people. And this is the bit, the fun bit where you get to choose your colleagues, although it's kind of a bit more difficult than that, really. As we've found out over many years and businesses, certainly for myself, can you afford them? So I might want a whizzy marketing agency to, to come on board, um, but our business is not in a place where we can afford that. So actually, are we looking at an agency? Are we looking at a very experienced freelancer? So like a middle priced person, or are we looking at a low cost option? Somebody who's just started out for themselves maybe and, and is looking for, for giving discounts for, for new customers, or do we do it ourselves? And I think we could consider doing like a time and money matrix, or you, know, you could plot it for yourself. And this is the point at which I think you should choose your colleagues. Now, this is something that people have said a lot on these kinds of presentations, and I've heard it a lot. And I think I was probably two or three businesses and about 10 years in before the penny really dropped for me and it became a reality that actually is you can't do it all yourself. You need to get people involved. And you're like, well, I haven't got the money or which people or what stuff. Well, those are the questions that I think you need to answer. So if you've got a particular problem, like we looked at on that previous section, and that is not enough customers, then not enough customers is a business problem. Define it, work out the sorts of help that you think you need, break the problem down into pieces and work out putting it back together. Who can help you to put it back together? 
because you'll be sitting a long time on your own doing the doing and also trying to kind of work it out and believe me i know because i've spent that time i wish it had happened quicker but it didn't so choose your colleagues who can help and i've had friends that i've asked recently for help around for example marketing strategy and they've come back they're a friend i've known them you know 10 years or more colleague from uh, you know previous uh, work or whatever, and they've come back with a really high price. And it's like, I, I just can't afford that. You know, so you have to kind of work through what you can do. So choose your colleagues. And that's the kind of management bit again, all of that, isn't it? And then the next bit for me is then the practical approach here is to build relationships. Because I consider all of these other people outside of my business uh, to be part of our winning team, then I need to build trusting relationships with them. They have, they hold a lot of, they probably hold as much authority and as much influence in my business as I do, quite honestly. Certainly thinking about, because we do a lot of distance learning courses, for example, now, certainly the guys that do, that look after that aspect, the technical aspect of our business have probably got more control over the success of it than I have, really. And so I kind of need that. I don't want to be the, the, the big person in the middle. We're part of a team. So I'm deliberately going with quite a flat structure. You can get caught out there, though, by the way. And maybe that's a, a by the way, for another time. But if you build trust in relationships with people and they've got the skills, have they got the skills you need? Do you trust them with your business? And can you work together? You know, can you grow together? And, and, and do they care? And a lot of time, quite honestly, people don't care about your business, whether they're a freelancer or a big company or whatever, no matter what you pay. Sometimes people really care about your success and sometimes they don't. The by the way, because I, I don't want to leave you with a cliffhanger. The by the way is if you I would warn against being too friendly with people. I think I've made the mistake early on in, in previous businesses, really, where I've ended up almost kind of too friendly with somebody like a contractor, basically somebody who's doing a particular piece of work as a separate entity. And then we seem to kind of get pushed to the back of the list all the time. You know, we're always waiting for them because because it's too friendly, which is kind of annoying and, and the wrong way around. You know, you should be helping your mates out, even though we're paying the same money as other customers. So watch out for being too friendly. But if you don't build trusting relationships with your people in your winning team, then you're not going to get things done. And then if you want to think about as well your own skills, and it says uh, further down the page there about influencing people, how do you influence people? If you're not good at influencing, how are you going to get stuff done when you get pushed to the back of the queue each time? How, how, what do you do? Do you throw money at them? Do you shout at them? Do you send them a nice email? Do you send them a horrible email? You need to know how to influence people. And so that's why we build trust. So that when things go wrong, we're, we're able to be brave and to sort it out and, and, and then continue working together. And then my final idea, I suppose, around communication with that. So taking the relationship to a practical place of, what sort of technology and so on are you going to use and how are you going to prioritize that communication? So what's important to you as a business owner? You're spinning a lot of plates. You know, we're kind of making we're trying to keep a lot of things on the go at the same time. And as soon as you focus on one thing, the other things kind of drop off a little bit, um, which I'm sure plenty of you will know. And that's why we have to delegate stuff. And I delegate as much as I can completely but i do need to have a, enough of enough control over that i need to just kind of um check in with people or get them to check in with me just when it's needed really so that they don't go too far off track or they don't feel overwhelmed but also that i know what's going on and i we can get really excited about it and celebrate our successes or manage our problems before they get too big so I thought I'd share with you just really briefly a couple of practical ideas. This is a mind map idea. Um, you could stick yourself in the center or your business in the center, and then you can just draw lines to define who the people are that you need in your business. So at the bottom, I've got bottom right, I've just gone for personal development. Have you got people who are your sounding board or your mentor or your people who are cheerleaders? You know, they're going to kind of 
support you through, uh, like I've mentioned a few moments ago. Have you got ongoing relationships? So at the top there, um, you might have um, a particular product expert. Um, it might be one of the team from the Digital Expo, or have you got an accountant or whatever? And then, so what are you delegating and what are ongoing relationships? You might have an IT company that looks after your computer or your network or something. Down the bottom, specialist relationships. Now, I think they're usually a bit more strategy based you know depending on a particular goal we're going to do a big push to get a load more customers this year so they're going to be specialist relationships and then at the top i'm not really sure you know is there a need for another box are there other boxes that you can think of that i haven't drawn on here so what am i going on about you could just do a bit of a mind map. By the way, this is a planning exercise. It's about, as it says at the top there, as a title, creating your success network. So who's in your winning team? What are their names? But I know it says accountant, but I know my accountant's name and I know who cheerleads and you know who's a sounding board. And I have a couple of mentors at the moment on the go for myself for different aspects of what I'm learning and so on. So do this for yourself. Use color. Um, identify named individuals, add to it over time, take, you know, take away from it, redo it, whatever works for you, really. But it's just an idea of a practical thing. It's a it's a relationship diagram or something like that. In terms of prioritizing those relationships, then we tend to working on strategic communication, usually with larger organizations, we tend and partnership working. We tend to talk about in management terms, thinking about how strong the relationship is uh, and, and what value it, it offers. And then we can uh, prioritize according to those criteria. You may have other criteria, but we need really strong relationships with key partners. Um, so, for example, we provide a lot of Chartered Management Institute qualifications. They are a key business partner for us. And we need to have a really strong relationship with all the different departments. Um, and we do that through particular means, you know, so through the style of our communication and so on, whereas other relationships may be lower priority, probably wouldn't show anybody that, though, we don't want them to feel upset that they weren't very high priority. Um, but it's your plan. Don't you know, you don't need to share it. It's just so that you know who's there to help and who's there to deliver on different stuff. So that's a little map of your winning team. And then finally, uh, if you prefer a table, so that's a relational sort of network diagram on the previous slide. If you prefer something that's a bit more uh, rigorous, it's a bit more of a table, then this is what a typical comms plan as a former project manager and program manager uh, in the past. Um, then these are the sorts of things for me that uh, we've, we've produced fairly routinely. So you could do the mind map bit or you could do the 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 kind of table so normally you need who the person or people are what role they're playing how we're going to communicate with them when we're going to communicate with them and really importantly and again this is probably a bit like work when you add like a proper job rather than a business uh the responsibilities or the deliverables and with my project management hat on for a minute, I would say that the responsibilities for each task or each deliverable should have a single person's name against it. Now, it's all lovely when you're setting off and, you know, so-and-so is just doing a few hundred quids worth of website design for you. Fine. But I would say that can still go wrong. And that still might represent quite a lot of money to you if you're just starting out. So, do you need this level of detail for that? Maybe not, but try a Trello board. You know, if if that works for that person or it works for you or Slack or where these are all free for, for very small businesses, you know, up to two or three users normally. So either use whatever uh, technology you find useful and, and insist that those people use that for you, um, which is quite common, or you can slot in with whatever they prefer to use. So this is a comms plan, I would call it. And it's kind of like a project plan as well. So it's a bit about communication and a bit about tasks and getting things done and that's it really so what i would say is um i hope you found that useful we've taken a little wander through focusing on you and your management and leadership skills and for some of you reminding you of what you can bring forward and what you're good at and not so good at some ideas for 
reflecting on the, the process you've been through around defining options to solve particular problems and move forward with those. And then the, the kind of key feature today has been about getting people involved. You can't do it alone. You must pull it together and engage with those people and celebrate when you get it right. So thank you very much. I've been John Chisholm from Crescent Management Centre. Um, if you've got any questions, then I'll happily take those, although I'm not sure exactly how we're doing that. Um, and I would also like to say there is a workshop uh, that I'm running on this same session. So that's at 2 p.m., I think. 1 p.m., 2 p.m. At 1 p.m. 1 p.m., 1 p.m., thank you. Um, so thank you very much for watching. Oh, John, absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, and as I say, obviously, you know, I don't know whether you want to put your sort of contact details um, in the chat box at all. Yeah. Um, but yeah, really excited to hear your workshop at one o'clock and thoroughly enjoyed that. So thank you again um, for being a, such an amazing keynote speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. <laughs>